Welcome to All the F Words, a podcast where two writer friends nearly 30 years apart explore everything we give an F about. I'm Gabby Moskowitz. And I'm Joanne Green. On each episode of All the F Words, we focus on a theme starting with the letter F. Things like feral, feasting, forbidden fruit, and Friday night. We'll share stories from our lives and our distinct generational perspectives and look to the experts for insights and ideas. Today, we're going to talk about the first time. Our first times. Now, we could talk about the first time becoming a parent or the first time buying a home, but let's be frank. When we talk about our first time, we are generally referring to sex. What does it mean to lose one's virginity? How do the circumstances of that one event impact us? Also, we'll do a mini dive into purity culture. Not that either of us can speak from experience. But we can imagine, right? Joanne, was your first time a good experience? I don't know that I would say it was a good experience. I definitely felt pressured. Uh, My boyfriend was two years older than me, and I felt like uh, it's going to happen at some point. And if it, you know, it might as well, you know, I might as well be now. Um, I was raised to believe that a good girl is a virgin when she gets married. My sister um, of blessed memory, who was eight years older than me, um, was a really good girl in every possible way. And I was, you know, not exactly that (laughs) in any way. And she had a boyfriend when she was in the end of college and he was a doctor, which, you know, that was right there hitting the, you know, lottery or something. And he wanted to sleep with her. This is what I understood in my early teens. And she said, no, not until they were married and they broke up. And then he came back Mm. and waited, which was the big sign for me that this was the way it worked. The mistaken idea I got in my head somehow was that sex was something that guys needed and wanted. And it was women's power to hold this, hold on to this. And if you really love me, then you won't just want me for sex. It was just a completely distorted notion. Never did anybody explain to me that women also loved, or in an ideal world, loved sex, wanted sex, craved sex, none of that. So, um, yeah. Mm. But that's not my first experience. So my first experience was like, you know, afterwards I felt kind of like, eh, what did I do? Um, okay. Now I'm over that hump. I guess. Um, it's a crazy story. My I had my dad dropped me off at the library. I was in high school and my boyfriend picked me up in his blue GTO and mm. we went to his friend's house. He had a key and you know, we had sex and then he dropped me back off at the library and my dad picked me up at the library and I remember driving home from the library thinking, Oh my god, if my dad had any idea he'd kill me. Did you use protection? Yes. And he, yes, we used what, what were, the brand was called Ramsey's. They were, it was um, condoms. Okay. We called them rubbers in the day. And he left the wrapper on the nightstand of his friend's, in his friend's bedroom. So the next day at school, his friend looked at me like, you know, nee, 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 nee. <laughs> And I oh, was boy. mortified because he had promised he wasn't going to tell anybody. But then it turned out this was March 31st. So the next morning was April 1st. So then he he told me that he had told his friend that it was an April Fool's joke and that nothing really happened. But I knew he really told him. Oh. But I, I gave think him he some... probably left it there as a little brag. 100%. <laughs> 100%. So Uh, what about you? Tell me about your first time. Well, it's a little bit of a convoluted story. Um, So my first uh, boyfriend um, and I dated really only, we we were an official couple only for a few months, my senior year of high school. 
And then we broke up uh, like two or three days, three days before my 18th birthday. And I was so devastated and we had not, um, had not gone all the way. And um, a few months later, I was trying to, trying to get over him. Um, and I was trying to go out with other people and or really like make out with and hook up with other people. And I, there was this guy who I met at a party and uh, he, we started messing around and he got out a condom and clearly didn't know that I was a virgin. And, um, and I gave it a try and I freaked out and it was uncomfortable and I, cried and I embarrassed. I mean, in retrospect, I'm not embarrassed because it was like kind of a big thing to be, but at the time I was really humiliated that I was having such an emotional response. But of course I sort of implied later when, you know, I, I, um, the next time I did see my ex-boyfriend we were not together, but I, I implied to him that I had gone all the way with someone else because I wanted him to be jealous. And so, uh, to this day, I'm not sure if he knows that uh, that wasn't really the case. But anyway, flash forward to... Oh, I hope he's listening. <laughs> I sure do, too. Um, and uh, flash forward to a few months later, um, we had sort of reconnected. We weren't really together, but we were we were seeing each other. And um, we... Uh, then I ha- actually had my my real first time with my first boyfriend, um, and it was it was like for some reason I I kept freaking out every time we would we tried a few times and I kept kind of freaking out. It was like I don't even think I was using tampons at the time. I really d- didn't. The experience of anything going inside of me was um, foreign, and uh, when it finally it finally got going and it was like, it was like, I remember (laughs) we were doing it and I felt like, okay, I'm doing it. I'm having sex. This is, this is okay. This is good. And he was very sweet. And, um, and it was, it was neither the most earth shattering thing that ever happened to me, nor was it upsetting or traumatic or painful. It was, I think, while there's a part of me that wished that, you know, it had been when we had been together the first time or a little bit more romantic or it it was, it was totally great. And that's, yeah, that's the story. Probably not typical. I think if you were to get a collection of um, 25 women, which actually someone did and Mm. women's health magazine did this, um, got Mm. 25 women to share how they lost their virginity. The vast majority of the people had lousy experiences that first Mm. time. Um, Mm. There is so much emotion involved. Um, Performance anxiety, which people think is only for men, not true. It's on both sides. And it hurts. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It hurts. It hurts. I just think that it's important to say that the first time. Yeah. yeah, so I think a lot of people end up wanting to get it over with, which I mm-hmm. think is another really interesting concept. While some people grew up as I did, thinking that virginity was prized and that if I weren't such a bad person, I would be able to hang on to this for, um, you know, maybe the next 10 years and resist wow. whatever. Oh, that's so different from right? how I grew up resist whatever temptation. First of all, I thought there was something wrong with me because I really liked kissing and Mm. I had, you know, these feelings and I thought, Ooh, this is a problem. You know, maybe I'm a nymphomaniac. And, um, let me ask you a question. Uh, When you were in high school, do you remember having sort of a, a passing awareness of the stage like the base, as it were, um, that all of your friends or all of the people you n- knew had gone to. I remember knowing who was having sex. I mean, and, and when I grew up, it was it was different. I, I, it wasn't at least for me. And with I me, mean, my um, my mom was very sex positive. My parents never ever 
had any um, expectation or even the suggestion, or I don't even think they would have thought it would be a good thing for me to wait until I got married. Um, I'll tell you a, st a story at some point about uh, a, a, an article my grandfather sent me about how you don't have to test drive a car before you buy it. Um, <laughs> it's very <laughs> funny. Yes, yes. But, but you know, I think my parents were pretty sure, hey, you should test drive the car. Make, make sure you want to drive it around. Um, but uh, I do remember knowing who was having sex, who wasn't. I remember knowing how far, at least definitely how far my friends had gone, and also that it was sort of common gossip knowledge about, like, who was having oral sex, who was... I so, just, okay, it, so that's different. That changed over the years. So we had bases, you know, you had mm. your first base, you were making out. Second base was being felt up, but it wasn't mm -hmm. like on the shirt or under the shirt, on top of the bra or under the bra. Third base is, you know, what it, we had, a, we called it fingering. But it mm -hmm. was, yeah, we did too. <laughs> I believe that was digital penetration. And then all the way was... Um, all the way. I, in high school, I know this is going to sound absolutely insane, but I didn't know that oral sex existed. Mm. I didn't know that until sometime in or after college. That just, there was, first of all, there was just not, there wasn't easy access to the, to porn the way there is now. There wasn't, I mean, movies, were not so explicit. Nothing was as explicit. Things were just quieter. But yes, I absolutely knew there were the fast girls, right? There were the girls who you knew were, you know, making out when other people were just kissing in the in the closet with kissing games, even in like eighth grade. But ninth grade was when things really shifted. And then 10th grade, and I think for me, it's because of exactly when I was in high school, which was 67 to 71, everything changed all across the world. So if you mm. were in your 20s, everything changed very much in the late 60s, early 70s. And and if you were in high school, you know, you kind of got swept up in that. And I was in high school just outside of Boston. And so it was, you know, urban enough, let's just say, that that we got swept up in, in the whole wave where um, the pill was readily available. Um, you could go to New York for an abortion. Um, abortion was legal in New York. And so I knew people who, you know, went to New York for an abortion. You didn't mm. have to have an illegal abortion. Um, Planned Parenthood was around, had just, I mean, I don't know exactly when they began, but it was... They were ubiquitous by then, um, and people weren't necessarily going on the pill early in high school, but, you know, later in high school, maybe. Yeah, I did, before my parents knew. I have a, a, a vivid memory of the different, um, the different, knowing who was on the pill and thinking it was like kind of glamorous and exciting for someone to be on the pill. You're, you're, you were secretly on the pill. At the beginning, yeah. Wow. Yeah, I went to Planned Parenthood. Yeah, you did not need- What was that like? You didn't need parental, it was great. It was like a whole new world. They treated me like an adult. How old were you? Somewhere in the teenage years. I don't know, maybe 17, something like that. After you'd had sex for the first time? Oh, yeah. Oh, wow. Also, I had terrible menstrual cramps and they went away. So that was pretty great. Oh, yeah. But yeah, but I that. but I had convinced my mom that marijuana was a better way to deal with menstrual cramps than taking prescription painkillers. And I had <laughs> this is this is this I can't make this up. Darvon was the prescription painkiller of the day, and that's what I would take because I would get horrible menstrual cramps. And I convinced my mom that marijuana was an herb and it was natural. And that if I smoked marijuana in my bedroom when I had my period, um, that I didn't have to take Darvon. And she she bought it. She bought the whole thing. I, can Good you job. imagine this? And so uh, that's what I did. I mean, you weren't wrong. You weren't no. wrong. I have, I've definitely experienced relief from an edible weed gummy before when I've had bad cramps. But wow, that is impressive. I, I'll tell you, my... 
my parents who are very um, progressive would definitely not have fallen for that. They would say, here's the Advil. Right. So my parents were not progressive. Mind you, they were in their 40s when they had me. So, mm-hmm. so right. So they, and my brother was 13 years older than me. They, pro- mm. they were progressive politically for sure. I mean, we were, you know, they were died in the wool Democrats and all of that, but my mom was into making her own yogurt and putting wheat germ on her cereal. And the idea of a herb that grew in the ground, helping my menstrual cramps for her, it just sounded more benign. Mm-hmm. And, um, I get it. And I didn't drink alcohol. I was not into alcohol for a variety of reasons, ranging from A, it had calories, to B, it was disinhibiting and I was terrified that I would have sex. Or some, I would like stumble my way into having sex if I drank. So I always told my parents that I and my friends smoked marijuana because that sort of was the what what intellectuals did. We were intellectuals. Mm. We were into um, reading and studying and expanding our minds. And they were like, "Oh, like you were like nerdy beatniks, not even nerdy, but to them nerdy, yeah." So, I mean, look, I was that kid who could convince her parents of darn near anything. And um, until years later, when I felt like I was going under and I really needed help and I started blurting out all the things that I had done and my poor mother, I can't even believe I did this to her. And I was like, I'm a mess. I'm a mess. And I did this and I did this and I did this. And she's like, oh, what am I going to do? Oh, my God. Yeah. Mm. I do not wish a child like myself on you. Or my <laughs> my daughter's in law. <laughs> oh. <laughs> I was not easy. Hey, let's talk about the definition of virginity because you and I are both um, heteronormative, cisgender, blah blah, and mm-hmm. we're talking about virginity in the old way, which right. is penile penetration of a vagina. But that does not, for instance, take into account people who have sex other ways. Yep. So I think it's important to note that gay men and lesbian lesbians have different definitions and it's a, it's a pretty fluid definition. So mm-hmm. for some people it involves any sort of sexual stimulation and satisfaction for others, um, oral sex or anal sex qualify as losing one's virginity. It's interesting. Well, to that end, as it were, I, I would say uh, the first time I had oral sex, which happened before the first time I had vaginal penetrative sex, was I found it far more uh, far more intimate, far, far more physically intimate than having sex than ha- than than P and V sex. Um, <laughs> I mean, <laughs> it was. As the kids say, uh, it it was, uh, I mean, yeah, like your, uh, and then there were, oh God. For me, it was like years in between the two. Yeah. And in the reverse order. Um, in the reverse order. Oh, so you had, you had penetrative sex and then you had oral sex later. Way later. Now, when you had oral, did you give or receive first? I don't remember. <laughs> I really don't. (laughs) I just remember the whole thing freaked me out completely. And I thought that I was supposed to do this, but it was like, "Ah." it it just completely freaked me out. I mean, the whole thing, yeah. Oral, oral. Why do I hope my sons are not listening to this episode? Well, if they were, they've stopped by now, I'm sure. (laughs) Good point. Very good point. Uh, You know, um, Oral sex, I remember the first time I first time I gave oral sex, I remember thinking, like, I'm just going to take, clearly he was enjoying it, and I remember thinking, I'm just going to take uh, everyone's word that this is a good thing to do, because, boy, is it weird. And I also remember the first time I received it, the guy who I was with was, it was also his first time giving it, and he was very freaked out by the experience, by the smell, and I, which of course I 
concluded meant there was something wrong with me. Of course. And worried, (laughs) you know, like, and um, I remember he had this bright idea to put a little bit, a little bit of his cologne under his nose so that he, and it was like, and he was like, try he he met he meant it in a good way he was trying to be so sweet and I was like and I just remember and then he would wear the cologne later and I was like I don't want to smell that and it was uh, I mean gosh it's so the whole thing is so vulnerable and it really I mean I think what we're going to talk about about this idea of virginity is the idea that that penis and vagina sex as being the definition of virginity is just proof that it is the whole thing is a construct you know 100 percent, because there is no actual definition there's no standardized medical definition of virginity there is no way of proving its loss because of course mm-hmm. the hymen that little piece of tissue can be torn or broken in a variety of other ways from sports from horseback riding from you know somebody bumping on a bicycle seat, whatever. Um, And the other thing about it that feminist scholars have been saying for a very long time is that sexual intercourse, as you describe as the P and V, results in absolutely Mm -hmm. no change in one's personality. So it's a myth. Um, I I was reading about uh, a woman, Jessica Valenti, who wrote The Purity Myth. Are you familiar with this? Uh, I am. Yes, I'm also familiar with Jessica Valenti because I grew up with her husband. Can't make that up. And Andrew Golas, who's a, also a, a great writer and editor. Well, that's yeah. wild. Um, it's a fascinating um, uh, study that she does. And she says that valuing virginity has placed a woman's morality between her legs, that sexual activity Mm. has no influence on morality or ethics. I grew up feeling that that was what morality was, that you were a moral, ethical person if you could say no to sex until marriage. Did you think men, did you apply the same logic? Oh, no, not at all. No, no, no. Yeah. No, because the thinking was, and I don't know that this was ever explicitly stated or if this is what I understood from what I did hear, was that when boys reached puberty, they became obsessed with sex. They thought about it all the time. They needed it. They had erections. They you know, blue balls would, would be this horrible thing that would be your fault if, mm-hmm. if, if, if they had it. Um, and so you had to be not too provocative. You had to be not too sexy at any point. And yet we were getting all these other messages from the world, um, Marilyn Monroe and all of that stuff that you were supposed to be sexy. And so the Madonna whore complex, right? F- for you know sure. What I'm talking about. Yeah. Yes, yes. But it was the 60s. So mm-hmm. then it was the whole hippie thing. And so it was very different messages. So the way that I understood it was that my mother and sister were part of an old world and I was part of a new world. Mm. And that I, and I carried all this baggage of feeling like I was bad. But I was still part of the new world. I was still going to do all these things, but I was going to feel like a bad person mm-hmm. as a result. So, yeah, I was a mess. Well, then I had anorexia, which I think in addition to being about power and control and food was about turning back the clock on my sexuality because it effectively did that. My body completely receded. I stopped menstruating. Um, I was like a, I had like a little boy's body. For, for a couple of years. Yeah. So I think that was in part a reaction to all of that confusing messaging around sec- emerging sexuality. I do remember, you know, I went through puberty kind of on the early side. And I remember there was a time when I remember the first time I was out, I think it was with my mom, we went out to lunch um, somewhere and the waiter was like flirting with me and he was an adult man and I was maybe 12 or 13, but I had breasts and wasn't trying to look a certain way, but it was clear that I was presenting as 
much older than I was. And I so, I just so remember having this awareness that it was like kind of simultaneously exciting because it was kind it was fun to get attention, but also I had this awareness that my maturity level didn't match what I looked like on the outside. And, uh, then it wasn't long after then that friends started to not most people I knew weren't having sex, but in, I, in middle school, I knew some people who had, and it was like, that was when kind of the divide began between those of us who were still kids and those of us who were becoming women or, you know, teenagers. Um, but we weren't, we weren't not, you know, not that we're going to have a conversation about who's old enough to have sex, but, um, but there, it was, there was clearly a a difference between who, who was a kid and who was turning into a, a, you know, a mature person. You're not going to say slut, right? (laughs) No, no, definitely not. Definitely not. Okay, good, 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 good. Truly not. So there's another really big difference between the times in which you grew up vis-a-vis sex and the times in which I did. And that is um, sexually transmitted diseases were really Mm. not of concern. When I was a teenager and in my 20s, the concern was getting pregnant, period. It was not about getting a life-threatening illness. And in the 80s, of course, that changed with the advent of of the AIDS. Um, I was endemic, pandemic. I'm not sure what the right word is to you. Whatever. Uh, Well, it was a pandemic. It was. and Yeah, for sure. So now what has happened... I have come to learn in my research is that there's something called technical virginity, which is that a lot of um, teens hang on to technical virginity, but they're willing to have oral sex and even anal sex in order to both um, avoid pregnancy and avoid the risk of a sexually transmitted disease. Are you familiar with the uh, comedy musical duo um, Garfunkel and Oates? No. Well, you should, and we'll put it in the show notes uh, 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 with a, with a forewarning. If you're, if you're um, sensitive to, um, uh, well, I guess if you're, I guess if you're sensitive to sexual topics, you probably wouldn't be listening to this podcast, but um <laughs> This there's a song that they do called the loophole that is specifically about um, Christian teens and um, the backdoor approach um, to this concept you're talking about. That is quite well done and very hilarious. So Garfunkel and Oates, we will check them Garfunkel out. and Oates. Yeah, I'll, I'll I'll text it to you and we'll put it in the show notes. So let's talk for a minute about this idea of purity. And it's really been something that's always been focused on women, right? That men could have experiences and that was okay. It's also been a part of various different um, religious cultures and still is in many places Mm -hmm. in the world. The places in the world where people are having more sex and younger sex tend to be places where religion plays less of a role in the public sphere. Hmm. Interesting. Uh, Well, so let me think that through. So in places where people are young, when there, when there's more sex and younger sex, religion has less of a role in schools. So not not necessarily in schools, no, just in life in the, it just, right. So in countries that, that tend to be more religious countries. And this could be any religion, really. This could be certainly Islam, Christianity, and Judaism. Um, There'd be more effort. Also, people are getting married younger in those cases. Okay. Oh, so, so uh, in places where there, where there's more religion, then people tend to have sex younger or, or they tend to wait, you're saying? They tend to wait till marriage. Marriage happens younger. It's it, oh I see. It's interesting. It's interesting. You I would think that it, the opposite would be true. That that because it because that it that it that it would not work. I would think that religion would be brought into the culture and pushed on people, and people would go against that and would rebel. 
but it sounds like you're saying. Oh, are you talking about yourself, get- perhaps? <laughs> I did not really rebel that much against my parents' liberal Judaism, but I rebelled <laughs> against other things. Um, but uh, I would, yeah, no, I, but yeah, maybe, maybe my, my somewhat rebellious nature is what I was leading with. Or the fact that, the fact that abstinence, um, sex ed doesn't work, that all it leads to is, you know, higher um, teen pregnancy, it, it can. It certainly leads to this whole technical virginity thing where people yeah. say, oh, if what I'm supposed to protect is the this all holy hymen, then mm-hmm, mm-hmm. what else can we do? You know, and so right. but it's it's always been um, either cultural or religious um, traditions that have placed this high value on virginity and and tied it to honor and tied it to worth that somehow a virgin was worth more than a woman who had been, what were some of the words, deflowered. I mean, mm. think about the language and all of the, you know, the associations with the kind of words and terms that were used. Um, I mean, I think even spoiled is a word that, right? Mm-hmm, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Sullied. Yeah. I mean, somehow... Yeah defiled, right? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And that it happened to her. It wasn't something that she chose or willingly participated in, much less enjoyed. Right, right. Well, wanting it. Girls, I mean, even when I was growing up, girls wanting sex was, it. it, what we, we were supposed to be willing, but we weren't really supposed to be enthusiastic. You know what I mean? Like we didn't have conversations. This is such craziness, right? Yeah. Yeah. Such craziness. I remember there were girls who were really loose. We called them whores. I have to admit it. It would be like the sluts of another, of another era. And Mm -hmm. I remember thinking about it and thinking, is it something that they just really want? Or are they so insecure that they're doing this just to, you know, have the attention of the boys? I mean, I remember even yeah. at the time thinking, like, what is this about for them? Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I remember. I remember. Well, I think that I looked at it. I was so um, – it took a while before I figured out how – I mean, I think this is pretty normal. But it took a while for me to figure out how to – like, what I liked and how to enjoy sex. And even when I um, – I really like you. I really like kissing. Um, but a lot of the other stuff took a little while to, um, to, to figure out. And I do remember having had like a passing, just a little bit of experience, um, of sexual experience and kind of looking at these girls who were more experienced than I was, um, you know, via the, the rumors I was hearing anyway, and wondering like, gosh, they must know something that I don't know they must have experienced something that I have yet to experience. And even though clearly everyone has a lot of judgment about them, I'm kind of curious. I wish, I wish that I knew what they knew. Um, It was, you know, I think I had this tendency to sort of project um, maturity and elegance and coolness and glamour onto, um, onto girls like that. And, I was always, I always wanted, I wanted to know what they knew that I didn't know. See, and I thought they were bad. I just thought they were bad. I was bad and they were worse. That's what Mm -hmm, I thought. mm -hmm. And that the way my sister was, was the ideal and that's how I should be. But too bad I wasn't. I wasn't wired that way. Therefore, I had to just make peace with who I was. Mm. This is so crazy. Now, the other mm. thing that, that um, I did a little bit of research on, and I, I don't need, we don't need to spend a lot of time on it, but I, I did put a few things in the show notes was on like, one is the adult's guide to losing your virginity. Like some people mm. um, for whatever reason um, remain virgins into adulthood and, you know, really they need a little bit of assistance perhaps in how to frame this and how to move into it. Um, one thing I think is, is key to say is that 
the first time might be lovely and beautiful and romantic and you might envision little songbirds floating all around you and you may not. In fact, you likely won't. Mm. And the first time will probably come with a fair amount of awkwardness on mm-hmm. your part or his part, or it'll go too fast or it'll go too slow or something about it won't be quite right. And that's fine because the first time is just that. It's the first time. And, and then, also, and then it's yeah. over. And then every other time is a subsequent time, right? Well, right, right. And also, like, sex is like anything you do with someone else in that it's um, – even when you've done it a bunch of times before with that person, there are times when it's not, I think that we put all of this um, importance on the first time uh, and expect it to like change us. I do remember looking at myself in the mirror and trying to figure out if I actually looked different after the first time I had sex. Let me guess you didn't. I didn't look, (laughs) I didn't look different at all. Uh, No. But it, it is, it's like anything in that um, the, it's like the first time you do anything where you, you don't quite know what you're doing and then you get to know what you're doing a little bit more. And um, and then even after that, sometimes things don't quite go right. And it's just, it's not, being able to communicate during sex eventually is no different than being able to communicate or should, should be, I should say, no different than being able to communicate um, any other time you're doing something with someone. And the key is be able to communicate, make that effort. Mm -hmm. Um, Mm -hmm. I think all too often why things don't work out for couples is because they, first of all, make assumptions that the other person knows what they're feeling, knows what they're thinking. They can't. Mm -hmm. They are, they are Mm -hmm. a separate person. And, and so it's always best, I think, to share what's, what you're feeling. And, and we didn't even get into the way that porn, probably, uh, especially with this generation, we've talked about this before in, in previous episodes, but the way that porn has has led, um, especially young people, to develop expectations for um, to expectations and also um, uh, thoughts about how they should be. How they should sex. look, how they should yeah. be, right, all of the above. And um Right. So what is the message there? Just know that if you've seen a lot of it, it is not they're necessarily. Acting. Yeah. <laughs> I think I think they're the they'll they'll porn actors will be the first to tell you that um that it's a performance. And, you know, uh there are there's a time and a place for performance, but a good partner is somebody who um as uh Dan Savage, the sex writer, says, is good giving in game. They're good. They're giving and they're game to try what you want to try. And so um, being able to, uh, I, I think often the shame, especially women feel about wanting, being being specific and explicit about what they want gets in the way of um, really uh, being able to ask for what they want. So and so that's why being with someone you trust is important. And, um, and also just trusting that you deserve to be touched the way you want to be touched and, and not um, touched the way you don't want to be touched above all, or as my three and a half year old granddaughter tells me, you have to ask before you touch me. Well, she is right. She is right. Thanks for listening to all the F words. She's Gabby Moskowitz and I'm Joanne Green. You can follow us anywhere you get your podcasts. We are also on social media. We are all the F words pod and Instagram, Twitter, Facebook, and YouTube. And you can email us at all the F words pod at gmail.com. We'd love to hear from you. Bye-bye. Bye. Bye.